Brendan Cradell, film studies and production professor at Oakland University. Professor, thank you for being with us today. Hi, Tyler. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to have you with us. How are you? How is your team? Uh, I'm well. Um, I'm I'm just hearing the news actually for the first time about the postponement of the festival. So <laughs> I'm glad that I got to tune in a bit early. Um, but you know, I think I think that's probably the right decision to be quite frank with you. I can appreciate the situation that Imagine is in, just like theaters all across the country, and that this is an extraordinarily hard time for businesses. that are you know retail uh, effectively, right? They're in the business of of renting out seats in air conditioned rooms for a few hours so that we all can enjoy ourselves. Um, but I, I think, look, I'm a doctor, but I'm, I'm not that kind of doctor. Uh, and I trust the ones who do know um, what they say, that the, the right thing to do right now is to, to continue to stay vigilant and uh, make sure that whatever progress we've made, hard earned progress we've made thus far, uh, and fighting back COVID uh, is something that we can hold on to rather than see ourselves slip back into, into the grip of what can be a really deadly disease. Absolutely. And uh, things have <clears throat> changed. Our, our way of living has definitely changed during this coronavirus pandemic. And filmmaking has definitely been changed yeah. because of COVID. Productions are halted. Theaters are closed. How has the industry yeah. been impacted by the pandemic? Uh, massively, but disproportionately. And I think this is the thing, you know, I think we can have some sympathy for the, particularly exhibitors in this because in some ways, this is the best of times. If you're a streaming service, all of a sudden you have a captive audience who's watching far more hours per day than uh, is typically the case. And so we're in a sort of golden age of streaming content. Um, on the other hand, uh, that streaming content needs to come from somewhere, right? Um, and <laughs> The, the productions are ground to a halt. We're starting to see uh, some very slow progress. We've seen some films shoot on location in different parts of the world and develop protocols for how to do so safely. And I understand that the unions have been working to develop protocols here in the US that are going to allow them to do so, which is encouraging. Uh, but you know, for anyone who's ever been on a film set, you know that you're standing arm to arm with people for hours and hours in a day. It's hardly the kind of place that lends itself to the kind of protocols that we think of uh, for social distancing. So it's going to be a hard thing to do. And until then, you know, it's a finely oiled machine that produces the media content that we all come to depend on. And um, I, I fear that we're going to be seeing not just a temporary disruption, but what could become really a pipeline problem over the next couple of years. I, I wouldn't be surprised either. And, and it is, and it, I, I can definitely attest to what you said. It, it's it's got to be really tough to enact these social distancing and these mask wearing and these other measures on film sets where you are on, on sets for 12 hours, 14, 16, 18 yeah. hours, every single day you're in close proximity to people and time is always of the essence. Time is money is definitely exactly. a worthy saying in the film industry. <laughs> you're not going to have a whole lot of time to wait a minute. We can't do another take here for another five minutes. Everybody's got to sanitize their hands and switch out masks it's not entirely feasible and it's got to have a major impact on production of films and television shows, single camera shows in particular going forward. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I mean, I, I think that's the most glaring uh, example of how COVID has disrupted the industry. But if you think about what comes after you get the film in the can, you got to get the film to a film festival so that you can introduce it to your audience. Well, this year, all of the major festivals to date have canceled or gone online. We're still waiting to hear about Toronto, uh, but that would be the last of the major festivals for this year. Um, and then you've got to get your film into theaters. And right now <laughs> that's not possible. Um, and the way that theaters are built, you know, the architecture of theaters is designed to cram as many people into a space as possible in order to maximize the efficiency. Um, it's a tough business that theaters are in, uh, and it, it, it's not as if they're working with fat margins, right? So uh, they've developed a model that's worked very well for them, uh, but it depends on us being pretty close to the person next to us. And mm -hmm. that's not something that many of us are comfortable with doing right now. Uh, and yeah. I don't know the, the, the lasting impact that that's going to have on theaters, I'm afraid, frankly, of what that lasting impact will be. And I'm sure that's partly what's motivating Paul Glantz's comments there. 
I, if I were his counsel, I might not advise him to be <laughs> quite so blunt in talking to the attorney general, but mm -hmm. um, I, I can appreciate that, you know, it's a frustrating position and potentially an existential threat. It is, and the industry is absolutely going to change from the production end, from the distribution end, from the consumption end. It already has really changed, and and just from a philosophical end as well. So I want to ask this <coughs> on two different yeah. fronts, and I'll, I'll start with the, the more simple side of it. Uh, people have been consuming more straight-to-digital content during the pandemic, and even before the pandemic, it's become the, the choice here, with especially with theaters closed, and we're seeing mm -hmm. a lot of major companies and major stars do straight to digital films now that this is the the norm and instead of releasing them in theaters a because theaters aren't open but also b because it gets the film out now when there's less competition and gives you a better chance to get more exposure with that being said do you believe that theaters are going to be a thing of the past or different or there's going to be a different relationship with them than there has been in the past. And we'll see more movies with A-list stars from A-list studios even going straight to digital or both in theater and digitally. Yeah, I mean, this is the million dollar question. Um, and uh, I'm afraid that no one has the answer to it. My opinion is that uh, the ritual of going to the movies is uh, is a sort of, a, a secular version of the public gatherings that people of faith do, right? Um, that for more than a century, we've, we've gathered together in communities to watch films. That shared experience is, I think, ingrained generationally in the way that we uh, consume films. And in fact, it even affects the way that stories get told, right? Obviously, when we go to a theater, we're expecting a story to begin, develop, and end over the space of two hours. Um, that's not something that we would expect watching uh, the same thing at, at home. We'd expect either a, a 30 minute or hour long uh, story, or we'd expect a serial over the course of a season or something like that. Uh, so I think there are deeply ingrained cultural practices that uh, suggest to us that we as a, as a society want, maybe even need movie theaters. Um, and that's the good news. I think, you know, to the extent that there's what academics would call a public sphere built around the cinema, it's in the space of movie theaters. Um, but as you say, that public sphere isn't going to uh, put food on the table for, for those who own movie theaters. And for Imagine, for Cinema Detroit, for all the uh, either in independent theaters or local chains here in Southeast Michigan who don't necessarily have access to Wall Street capital or lines of credit to float them during these hard months. I'm, I am really concerned that global changes to the way that we consume media along the lines of what you're suggesting are going to ultimately prove a real challenge to their business. Joined by Brendan Cradell, the film, stu film studies and production professor at Oakland University with us on the Oakland County Megacast. So now on to the second half of that question I, ha I have for you. We talk about the yeah. changes as a result of what's been learned over the last several months uh, from a production side, from a distribution side, especially in theaters and, and digitally, but also on mm -hmm. the philosophical side. We've learned a lot, mm -hmm. especially this month with uh, with different police shootings and the protests that yeah. amounted from it, the conversation that started uh, about Black Lives Matter, about changing the landscape of our of our nation to include more equity and to erase and replace some of these standards of systemic racism in industries and just in general society that we have either not addressed or frankly ignored for generations. Yeah. And that includes in the film industry uh, and that includes in the film industry. Do you believe as a result of what we've learned so far this month, what we're going to continue to learn as this movement continues to progress and that, that conversation continues to be had, that there's going to be more avenues for, for black people and for people of color and for women, for, for other minorities, for LGBTQ people to have, better, to have a bigger voice in film, in television, and in, in general media production going forward? I certainly hope so. Um, you know, in in preparing for this interview today, I, I happened to look back on copies of the Detroit Free Press from 
31 years ago, June 1989, which is when Do the Right Thing was released in theaters. And Do the Right Thing was one of the films that was supposed to be playing um, at the Juneteenth Festival at Imagine. Um, and I was struck by letters to the editor uh, that residents of the Detroit suburbs were writing, expressing what, what Public Enemy, who are featured in that film, would have called a fear of a black planet, uh, right? That uh, we, we should put some sort of warnings in front of do the right thing because we're afraid that it might cause violence in the theaters. Uh, when you look at the advertisements for do the right thing in the newspaper, you notice it's only playing in a handful of theaters, most of which are in Detroit or immediately around Detroit. Um, at the same time, that ad is next to an ad for When Harry Met Sally, which is showing in every theater in the suburbs. Um, I think when we talk about structural racism, we need to appreciate, everyone watching your program needs to appreciate that that encompasses everyone within the structure, which is to say all of us. And it's one thing to say there should be more films by black directors, because there should be, you know, and we should all be watching films by Barry Jenkins and Tanya Hamilton and Cassie Lemons and all the great black filmmakers who are coming up right now. But the truth is that um, there need to be structural changes to ensure the sustainability of an industry that allows for a variety of black voices and black stories to be told. And I, I applaud the sentiment of Imagine to host this festival, even if it's not going to happen. Um, and I would further suggest to them that it would be a really great thing, both for them and for all the theaters in this area, to redouble their efforts to ensure that there are black voices on their screens. because not only are there black people in their seats who want to see their faces on screen, but white people and other uh, racial groups need to be exposed to stories that are not familiar to them. You know, if Do the Right Thing had been playing in theaters throughout the suburbs in 1989, I don't know that George Floyd and Breonna Taylor would be alive today. Obviously, that's you know a, a huge leap of logic, but we wouldn't be approaching this conversation, having forgotten the names of Eleanor Bumpers and the other people who were murdered by police who are named in that film, right? Um, Absolutely. Brenda Carell, thank you very much for being with us today on the Oakland County MagaCast. I appreciate it. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Stay safe out there. You as well. Brendan Cardell, professor of film studies and production at Oakland University with us on the Oakland County MegaCast.